Hi, I'm Helen Bauer, and this is the Heart of Hospice podcast. The Heart of Hospice podcast is your source for compassionate and informative discussions about hospice and end-of-life care. I'm a certified hospice and palliative care nurse with over 15 years of experience. Whether you're a caregiver, someone with a serious illness, or you simply need to know more about hospice care, this podcast is for you. Join me as we explore all the aspects of hospice, from the details of caregiving to the emotional and spiritual dimensions of -of end-of-life journeys. For more resources and to connect with me, visit theheartofhospice.com and find us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Keep listening for today's episode. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice, and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. The Heart of Hospice podcast is being sponsored by The Death Deck, Featuring the End of Life Deck. The End of Life Deck is used by many healthcare providers as a casual way to help start conversations about end of life wishes. It helps people communicate what matters most to them. To learn more about the EOL Deck, visit thedeathdeck.com. Today I'm talking about end of life planning with my guest, Adam Zuckerman, founder of Buried in Work. Adam Zuckerman is the founder of Buried in Work, a company that simplifies end-of-life tasks and estate planning. His personal caregiving experience with the decline and death of his dad inspired Adam to create the Clear Kit, a system designed to cover all the crucial details needed to honor someone's end-of-life wishes in the event of their death. You can find the Clear Kits and a ton of other end-of-life planning resources at buriedinwork.com. In my discussion with Adam Zuckerman today, he's going to be sharing the story of how his dad went into hospice care and how his family had time to create meaningful conversations, including conversations about advanced care planning. Because of his dad's disease, Adam accidentally created an organizational kit to compile all of his dad's critical information that they needed for managing the estate. The kit is now available for people to purchase and use, and it's called the Clear Kit, C-L-E-A-R. Adam's company, Buried in Work, has also created some card games designed to help people share meaningful stories and share what matters most to them. So get ready for a great conversation. There's a lot to learn. Adam, welcome to the Heart of Hospice podcast. It's great to talk with you. Helen, thanks for having me on today. Oh, I love talking to other podcasters. I hate to say it, but it's so easy for me. Challenge accepted. <laughs> a lot of pressure there. A lot of pressure. Yeah. We're going to start off with a, an icebreaker question just so my listeners can get to know you a little bit. Totally unrelated to the work that you do and the work that I do. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Ooh. So I thought about this a lot, actually, and I think that it is a question that adults ask other people because they're still looking for ideas for themselves. <gasps> I kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. At first I thought, well, okay, but yeah, that's right? good. The, the problem is most adults have already heard of astronauts and firemen and different things like that. I never had a specific, I'm going to be this when I grow up, uh, but I think that I always knew that I would help people in some capacity. Uh, it seems like I'm doing that a little bit now, and maybe I found my spot. Absolutely. So like Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. You're exactly. in a helping profession. 
I like yeah. that. I wanted to be a photographer. Okay. I did. Do you shoot on DSLR or are you still 35 millimeter? Oh, that's harsh. DSLR all the way. Okay. All the okay. way. It was actually a trick question. I mean, most people just go, I don't even have a camera anymore. I just rock my cell phone. Oh, no. I just dropped several dollars on a brand new camera just because I could. Okay. Yeah. I chased the technology just a little bit. It's really more than I can use, but I still like to have it to play with. Canon or Nikon? Actually, I have a Sony, which is the Sony, yeah. old Minolta. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I don't understand most of the functions. I really literally just got it a few months ago. But I have a new grandbaby, so that's where yeah. all my photos, my photo time goes. It's my grandkids. Okay. Well, the Sony Alpha series is pretty good. Um, yep. Mirrorless. Yeah, we can have another podcast about tech if you want. We can talk about that. <laughs> Maybe you could teach me how to use my camera because it's got all the bells and whistles. But I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, that's what I, I thought about when I was a little kid. Okay. No astronauts here. All right. Well, it sounds like you really did become or create a career in a helping profession, doing what you do at Buried at Work. And we're going to talk about the event in your life, a huge event that was sort of the catalyst for what you're doing these days. And remember, you set the boundaries on your story, as always, Adam. No boundaries here. You can ask me anything you want. I'm an open oh. book. Well, nice, because that's always helpful for our listeners, definitely. So share the story of your hospice experience with your dad. Yeah, my hospice experience with my dad was much faster and a bit unexpected uh, than, than it could have been. So my father was at my house one day, and we were doing some woodworking in the basement, and he walks up the stairs and he goes, Adam, I'm tired. And my dad is not somebody to complain. And when he says I'm tired, it's a little bit different than if you or I say we're tired. We're tired. We take a nap. We go to sleep, drink some coffee. When he says I'm tired, he has to go to the doctor. And the reason why is that six and a half years prior to that day, he was diagnosed with leukemia for the first time. I actually donated bone marrow to him, which is a story in itself. Wow. And it's a blood cancer. So when you're tired, you go back to the hospital, you go back to the doctor. So he goes to the doctor. They have him run some tests. It's looking a little bit yellow. You can tell something's just a little bit off. They have him checked in the hospital at Hopkins in Baltimore. Great hospital, fantastic staff, wonderful treatment. And uh, he was there on Thursday, and he passed away 12 days later. So it was a really strange experience because we had six and a half years with him of knowing, you have leukemia. We are not going to be able to extend things forever. He relapsed once. They took care of it third time he relapsed it was it was very quick and while he was in the hospital uh, there was originally a little bit of hope okay he's back they're gonna fix him again Hopkins is great and then about six days in you started to realize there's really not much that that they can do for him he's just tired not hurting too much but just tired getting more uncomfortable and then three or four days before he passed away we were able to get him back to the house and hospice was called in and they did everything they could to make him very, very comfortable. And that process went so quickly. Um, and I didn't have much experience with hospice at, at the time that I learned a lot. And I'm very thankful that the, the hospice company that we used in Maryland was able to come in and just make the process so much easier on the entire family. Your story is so relatable to so many people across the country unexpected, short length of stay with hospice. Mm -hmm. Happens all the time. Over half the, the population of Medicare hospice patients are on 14 days or less with hospice care. So it's a, it's a roller coaster ride that takes you pretty fast. So I, I got to ask, Adam, was your dad considered, did he have uh, chronic leukemia? Because he'd been sick quite a while before it got bad. Yeah, you could consider it that. He had AML, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, mm -hmm. uh, I think is what the, the technical term was. He also, during the six and a half years, he had skin cancer, he had prostate cancer. Uh, mm -hmm. we, had a, we had a board where it was like cancer zero Andy four. <laughs> and each time it was, it was a check mark and we don't have that board anymore. It's kind of unfair. Like you just lose once and it's winner takes all in, in that situation. 
Um, but yeah, he, he was considered a, a long-term risk profile, I guess. Uh, when we actually contacted hospice, the most difficult part of the entire process was getting a chair and then a bed because we, we had to get them in the house um, to make him more comfortable because we couldn't or had trouble moving him on our own. Right. And finding the rental service for that was difficult with such a short you know, runway. And then the first hospice company that we called, which is phenomenal in the area, they just didn't have anybody available. So there's resource constraints. And the second company that we called on recommendation of, of someone, they were able to come over and honestly just a matter of, of half, a, half a day. But it opened up my eyes that there's a lot that needs to be done. There's a lot that can be done. There's a lot that can be answered ahead of time. Because it's not the time to to focus on answering questions that could have been answered a long time ago. Exactly. And my dad, when he was in the hospital, and even when he was brought home, he was still coherent. He was still having conversations. He was still making jokes, laughing. Like the story I can tell you a lot of stories if you want, but because of that, we had an option. We could talk to him about him and tell us one more story about when you were a kid. Tell us one more story about when you were growing up, or we could ask him where his passwords were for his accounts. <laughs> and we split that difference a little bit because we, we in a way, we, we had to, uh, recognizing what was happening. But at the same point in time, I didn't care about where his passwords were or his documents are because I knew I was going to find them. I'd rather get to know him and, and cherish that time because once he's gone, he's gone. Right. And, Precious time. Yeah. And that, I think, is one of the hardest things that I look back at is, you know, balancing who got to see him, what conversations were had, how much energy he had, what questions to ask. Is he comfortable? How is it impacting everybody else in the family? Um, it's it's just a strange, strange way to look back. So this is a super important point that you're making about wanting to have conversations that are meaningful, mm -hmm. not business. So we're always talking about upstream conversations when it comes to advanced care planning and estate planning, right? Upstream is always better. An ambulance is a crappy place to have an advanced care planning conversation. No. Right? Mm -hmm. That's a terrible place to do it. So when you get down to those last few days, those last few weeks, isn't it such a poor use of your time to have to say, can you tell me where the key to the safe deposit box is? What's your it's, password it's a, for your banking? How do I get into your credit card? It's a horrible use of time. It, it, I'd argue that it is among the worst things possible, but it's also some of the most valuable for you, but it's a selfish value in, in a strange way. Um, this whole instance led me to, to found Buried in Work, which we can talk about later if you want. I don't mind if we don't. But... The premise is, is that on average, it takes 570 hours to administer an estate in America. And that's far too much time. I don't know about you, right. but I don't have 570 hours laying around. Nobody has time for, for that. And the vast majority of that time is due to a scavenger hunt because you're finding information and learning what you have to do when the person who can very easily answer those questions is no longer around to help you answer those. So there's a value to, to doing things ahead of time. And it's not just that time savings later on down the road, but it's also the value of simplifying information for your heirs and your loved ones. So leaving them the gift of organization is really important. And it reduces family conflict, arguments, unknowing, guessing, gives peace of mind. And the hospice component of it is something that I think people take in palliative care, end of life planning is a component of people's estate plans that are oftentimes overlooked. Now, for us, what we found is that the majority of people that we talk to, when they when we talk to them about an estate plan, they go, oh, yeah, I have a will or I have a trust, if they do. Now, two-thirds of Americans don't have a, a will. 55% of Americans have one at the time that they, they pass. So as you get older, you typically create one or have a higher likelihood to. But they don't think of all the other things that go into estate planning. It's not just the transition of your of your assets and your valuables after you pass away. You literally need to put in place who gets called, when do they get called, what happens in your end-of-life plan, uh, who's going to advocate for you if you can't, what are your wishes, and just eliminate those, those questions. And quite frankly, people just don't know where to look for the answers. I think that's absolutely true. 
Absolutely true. And it all goes back to people don't want to talk about death and dying and loss. Mm -hmm. We're so death phobic in the United States. And yet you talk to anybody who's gone through an experience like this and and spent the over 500 hours in the horrible scavenger hunt while they're grieving. And they'll tell you, we should have had these conversations. Mm -hmm. We hear this all the time with hospice care, people who wait too late to start their hospice care. And the classic sentence is, I wish we had known about this sooner. I would love to be able to make significant change so that we eliminate people saying that when somebody dies. Yeah, absolutely. And you plan trips and you take actions for things that are so minor in the big scheme of things. And this is such an important aspect of people's lives that touches so many different people that is just overlooked. And it's easy. It's not a complicated process if you have the instructions in the manual of like, this is what you do, this is what you need to consider. But people just don't like to talk about it. And we need to change that. It needs to be normalized. And some cultures around the world are much better at it than others. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do is help people have those conversations. I love that. So... Let's touch back on your dad's time on hospice. What do you think you and your family got right when it came to your dad's end-of-life care? We were able to get him home. My dad is, or was, I still say is. It's kind of strange how that happens. That's okay. In a way, he's he's still with you. That's not bad. He's still here every day. I mean, the camera that I'm recording on right now and talking to you was his camera. Kind of weird. Uh... My dad was a family man, so he would wake up early, uh, go to work so he could get back home and have dinner with the kids every single night. It was always about, I love my family, I want to see my relatives, I want to see my friends. When his funeral rolled around, there were probably 200, 300 people there. It was was unbelievable. And we were able to honor him and honor his wishes by getting him back to the house from Baltimore. We live, you know, 45 minutes, an hour and a half, depending on traffic away from uh, the hospital is down there and having him in the house surrounded by loved ones because we had a little bit of an advance notice and we didn't know if it was going to be three days or two weeks, but we knew it was going to be sometime soon. Loved ones from literally around the world flew in to see my dad. And some people had time to to talk over Zoom. I mean, thank goodness for technology now, and the COVID actually normalized things for, for a bit. Uh, so, like, the really important people, not really important. If you're listening, everybody's important. But <laughs> some people got more access, you know. If John and Ellen calls, they always get through at them. Okay, John and Ellen are calling. Here they go. But having an environment where he was able to pass at the house, hospice was there at the time um family members were there it it was probably the most beautiful perfect way that he could have passed possible Um, but watching him in pain the last day it was not it was not fun it was not enjoyable uh, but it was perfect in a in a strange way how so was it perfect The room was joyous. We had myself, my wife, my sisters, their husbands. My mom was there. And it wasn't a room of like everybody crying. It was couples sitting together, holding hands, talking to him. He'd fall asleep. We're all supporting each other. And maybe joyous isn't, isn't the right word. Like compassionate, empathetic supportive. It was just right. I think that a lot of people don't utilize time that they have appropriately in times of stress. Um, One of the things that I reflected on, and I've had a lot of conversations with people afterwards, is that the process can make a lot of people uncomfortable. And you find people just staring at their phones all the time. And they don't talk to each other. They're just in the room and they're waiting. And they can be talking. They can have conversations. And my family, we were very fortunate that we did the exact opposite. A lot of people put their phones down. We talked, uh, there was food, you know, it, it was a a gathering of people to celebrate him as opposed to 
you know, the world is ending, which the world was ending um, in a lot of ways as well. But a lot of emotions uh, when I think about it still. Yeah. It was a send off. It was a send off yeah. with all of you there. That's amazing. So, yeah. so when you think back on how you guys handled stuff and how things <laughs> moved and progressed in those last few days at the house, what would you change, if anything? Ooh. It started off when he got back. We thought we were going to be able to handle everything ourselves. Ooh. So we couldn't get him the, the bed that goes up and down. So I was able to find a company that could drop off same day, one of the recliner chairs that helps him stand up. So that was great for the first day that he got back. And then it was very apparent, like, that chair, it just wasn't going to be enough. Um and as he got closer, it was more and more difficult to help him get to the bathroom. And it was a very quick trip uh, when he had to go. And the bathroom was 10 feet away from, from the room that he was in. But I was fortunate that I could help him because I'm still of the age where, where I have strength. But other people in the family are a little bit smaller than me or not as strong. Like It was difficult to take him by himself. And hospice was able to have somebody come in and stay overnight, which was absolutely fantastic and help. Uh, which was really neat. Like we got extra help at night full time. So if something happened, you know, my mom was upstairs or I was upstairs and my sister was sleeping on the couch uh, and we could help out, but we had someone that was there and we were very fortunate. I know that a lot of people don't have the, the opportunity to have somebody stay, but we decided that it was becoming a lot of extra work that we couldn't handle ourselves and having that expertise to fall back on um, just made it a lot easier for people. Sounds like you guys had a very rich experience with your dad and your family. Yeah, we were, we were very fortunate, I think. I wish people could see the smile on your face. Yeah, there's some, I think maybe joyous, joy is still the right word to use, even though it doesn't feel like it belongs. Yeah. Um, um, I have a, a friend, Lisa Kiefauer, who's um, a grief educator, and she'll tell you it's the both and. There's room for both joy and grief in the same space. Yeah. And in a weird way, I think that we're very fortunate to have grief. And to have grief means that you cared about somebody. It means that you had a connection. Yeah. If you go your whole life without having that as it relates to somebody, I think that you're missing out on what it means to be human in, in a way, or at least a, a beneficial part of it. Um, means you had something to lose. Yeah, exactly. And mm. we were very fortunate. I mean, we literally, and this is a joke that I've told on, on numerous podcasts and conversations. We were in the hospital, and this was probably two days before he came home. And we're literally saying, Dad, tell us one more story about XYZ. Tell us one more story about, you know, when you were a kid. What is your favorite way to relax? What is your favorite this? Like, all the things that we, we wanted to ask that we could think of actually turned into the card game. You can get on Barry to more sites. It's called One More Story. 126 cards, six categories, yada, yada, yada. But in the middle of that, the nurse walks into the room. And my dad, since he's been in a hospital for a while, and Hopkins keeps their nurses oftentimes for a long time. They have traveling nurses, too, that switch. But he knew the nurse by name. And he goes, nurse. And I'll just call her Helen because I don't remember her name. Helen. Why does a giraffe have such a long neck? And she looks at him, Andy, like, what are you talking about? I'm here to take your vitals. And he goes, so it can reach his head. And it's just such a stupid dad joke. <laughs> we all knew that he was going to die, or at least it was trending in that direction, and he's still trying to make people laugh. Yeah. And he was a really serious guy. He was senior executive at the IRS, acting director of federal, state, and local government, so go audit Michigan, for example. And... He just wanted to make people smile and, and leave the world a better place. And to the end, it, it was testament. Like, he could have been grumpy. He could have been upset. Why is this my time? It's not fair. And instead, he took the attitude of trying to comfort the people around him. This is my time. It's okay. It's a part of life. Just remember when you're doing projects at the house, Adam, you're continuing things that we started together. Um, he wanted to leave legacy messages for my mom and my sister. So we recorded some stuff while he was in the hospital that they didn't know about. I showed them later. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. It's, we were, we were really fortunate how, how everything came to be and it wasn't planned. 
And at the same point in time, it was total and utter chaos. <laughs> <laughs> I, right. But I think that's true. It's the both yeah. and, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, like, who's doing this? Who's got that? What needs to be done here? What checklist is there? Who's calling this person? Has this person been called? When are they getting in? How much food is here? How are we planning the funeral? What do we want to have happen here? What services need to happen? How, like, just so many moving pieces. Yeah. That, I don't know, this is the first time my dad died. What am I supposed to do? And then you personalize it. Like, after the funeral itself, um, we went back to my house. I'm Jewish. Uh, Shiva and whatnot started. And people came to the house after the funeral. Friends, family, whatnot. I was like, I'm not going home. So me, my wife, and a few other people, we went to Dairy Queen. And I bought myself an hour of time. And I just needed to not see people. And yeah. It's just, you got to take care of yourself. So maybe that's one of the biggest lessons right there. You have to take care of yourself while you do all this. If yeah. listeners, if you if you didn't hear anything else, hear that. You have to take care of yourself. I think that's so important. This conversation is so good, but we're gonna take a quick break. Hang on for more great content. The Death Deck now has another tool for families, caregivers, and healthcare providers to use. It's called the End of Life Deck. Just like the Death Deck, the End of Life Deck uses multiple choice and open-ended questions to facilitate conversations about end of life wishes. Certified hospice and palliative care nurse Helen Bauer shares why she uses the EOL deck. As a hospice nurse, I've seen the challenges people experience when trying to communicate their end of life wishes to family and friends. The EOL deck is the perfect blend of humor and reflection, making discussions about final wishes less painful and even a little fun. The EOL deck can be used by social workers, chaplains, nurses, and end of life doulas. To learn more about the EOL Deck and to purchase this helpful conversation starter, visit thedeathdeck.com. Okay, so I want to get down to the brass tacks because I want to talk about this system that you have. You've created some really good products um, based on your experience. You were told after your dad died, this system and your organization skills are fantastic. I wish everybody had this. You created a comprehensive system for managing your dad's estate. You mm -hmm. call it the Clear Kit, mm -hmm. C-L-E-A-R. So tell me what the name means, and then tell me some of the key features of the system. Okay. So I want to be really clear. I created the company by accident, and we can talk about the story. Uh, but it is not just me who created what the Clear Kit is. So it's an evolution of a lot of people's input. CLEAR is an acronym for Comprehensive Legacy and Estate Administration Repository. It's CLEAR, right? Oh, effectively, clever. Yeah, yeah. And effectively what it does is it help you, helps you organize all of the most critical information about your estate. So in the event that something happens, your family has all the information they need. And this is not just about your assets and your liabilities. Uh, it is what happens end of death. Do you have a will? Do you not have a will? Where is it? Who needs to be contacted? Uh, if you have pets, so like, for example, we have an entire pet profile section. We work with veterinarians to make sure that we ask the correct questions. And in the assets section, uh, we have it. So we worked with certified financial planners. I'm not an expert in everything, but when I'm not an expert, we brought in experts to make sure that the content that we were asking asked the right questions. And it evolved. So originally when we created Buried in Work, uh, it was a website that I thought would just have a few blog posts on it based on my experiences to help other people. And the reason why I created the website is when I met my mom's financial planner and showed her what I was doing. At this time, I called this company for this reason to talk about this account. These were the next steps. Here's where I'm tracking all the accounts. Here's where I have everything, you know, blah, 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 blah. And she said it was the most comprehensive transition she'd ever seen. And I had to give it away. So on one hand, on the shoulder, I was like, no, nah, you're lying to me. You just don't want me to move my mom's money. I've got power of attorney. On the <laughs> other hand, going, okay, it's kind of organized. So I showed some people. They said to throw it online because they know how to make a website. And I put it online, and I posted to a few websites, you know, Nextdoor, Facebook, LinkedIn type things. And in a week, we had over 10,000 visits. Now, it has grown since then. So it started off just having information, but people came back to us, and the inbox was full. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of emails. I mean, it's great that you're showing me and telling me how to do this, but I want you to help me do this. Right. 
And that's what the clear kit is, is it takes all of the checklists and the guides and it integrates it into a physical product that you have binders. They also come with a USB drive so you can fill the forms out and update them on PDF if you want. I hate it when people sell you a product and they go, oh, well, you want more? Buy more. Like We want to give you everything so it updates over time. Your key information about yourself, about your family, your background, your, your pets, your assets, your liability, your insurance, your taxes, those are in blue binders, custom manufactured, zipper closer, um, and those stay in your house. And then there's a binder that's orange, uh, that has medical records, medical legacy information, key contact information, a summary of all of your important estate planning documents. It has your end of life plan. It's comprehensive and that can go with you to the hospital. So in the event something's happening, you grab that book, bright orange, people can see it. It's not going to be lost and you can get to work and start organizing things. And then on the website itself, we now have, have over 1800 articles, a hundred checklists and guides, uh, we create databases and content for people when they reach out if they can't find information. And what I mean by that, uh, someone was in the hospital, the person next to them was saying they didn't know how to shut down an Amazon account. So we reached out to 100 of the largest companies in the country, and now you can come to us for free. 90% of our content is for free on the website. And you can learn how to shut down accounts and contact company information um, when you need to get in touch with them. And we've done that with unclaimed property databases. We've done it with what makes a will legal in your state. Uh, we've got templates and a whole host of other things. But the clear kit, going back to the original question, so sorry for the roundabout journey, it integrates all of the resources on the website into a package that my mom can understand. And if you're listening and you're my age, if you're sandwich generation, it goes to the mom test. Um, Unfortunately, it's been really well received by by people and companies that are using. It. Awesome! I love the content on your website. Um, Thank you. Podcasts, doulas, hospices, attorneys, mm -hmm. estate planners, all sorts of yeah. really anything so robust, so comprehensive. So you've got some card games, um, mm -hmm. and this is probably my favorite thing, right? Because these are end of life discussions, advanced care plan. Um, products. So tell me about the card games that Buried in Work offers. Okay. There are two card games. I mentioned one of them earlier. It's called One More Story. And they were designed to help capture the important stories and memories from someone before they pass. Uh, one More Story, it looks like a deck of cards, but a little bit thicker. It's 126 cards, six categories. Um, and it asks the questions that you don't know that you should be asking. And what's great is that we worked with actual game designers to design the cards. So they're really easy for people to understand. Uh, the questions were developed in collaboration with two clinical social workers. They're printed in the United States and Florida on a special type of card stock that feels like linen. So older people with dexterity issues, they can hold on to it easier. And they're showing up now. Like People are actually taking them on dates. We have hospice <laughs> companies that are, are buying them for their customers. Yeah. Uh, we are selling them at John Hopkins Hospital uh, in their gift shops, which is neat. They're available on our website as well. And the second game is called One More Story. Or no, the second one is called Nothing Left Unsaid, rather. There's my blooper. Um, and it helps answer a lot of the questions that are in the clear kit. So do you have a will? Do you have a trust? How do you feel about palliative care? Definition cards. Because you don't have enough time to fill out the clear kit when things are getting down to the line. But right. you may be in a hospital room and just want to write off some questions and record the answers so you know what, what's going on. Uh, but those are the, the two games that we have. And they play into all of the other resources. So... End-of-life planning, estate planning, comprehensive estate planning, like we said, is more than just that trust. It's more than just that will. And having to go to 18 different websites is just too much. You shouldn't have to go to estate sales, blah, 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 dot com to find an estate sale company and then go to a company about finding a cemetery and then learning about um, home health care agencies or what insurance I need or pre-need funeral insurance. And what we're doing is we're collecting all of those resources on one webpage, buriedinwork.com. And if we don't have the information for you, we then send you out to other resource providers and service providers that can. And that's why we created 20 directories. So 
by the time this is up, we will literally have 20 directories with over 50,000 listings. So you can find associations and charities and nonprofits in the space to business succession help, to estate planning lawyers and financial and tax professionals, to home health care agencies, hospice care, everything in between. Yeah, it's podcasts. Podcasts too, yeah. yeah. We, yeah. we already have close to 40 episodes that are recorded in the in the hopper and those are getting released on a, on a weekly basis. And the episodes for our podcast, it's it's so much fun. Like the the first one that we had was with somebody called the Coffin Confessor. <laughs> I and, saw that one. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, it, we he goes to funerals and stands up and says, "The person who just passed away asked me to to talk about this," and he reads a letter. And and it's not a joke. He's actually been hired by oh, the yeah. person. Oh yeah, he gets paid between twenty five hundred. No, he gets paid between twenty five hundred and ten thousand dollars to go, and he'll literally say, uh, "This individual told me to tell you that you shouldn't be here because you haven't been in my life for thirty years, and you just want the inheritance." But he also does other stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not a gag. He's actually hired by the person who's died. Yeah, but it, it, it's from that all the way to presence of organizations. Uh, we've got the head of Midio, which is revolutionizing advanced directives in, in video form with supplementary information, which is great. We've got presidents of organizations like the National Association of Estate Planners and, and Councils. What we're doing is we are providing a conduit for anybody in the industry that has tips and stories that can be tangible lessons for people to come on the show because it's far more than just having one narrow fence. You need to be exposed to everything in the industry. Absolutely. And podcasts are a great way to capture that. Um, so you talk about end of life doulas. You talked mm-hmm. with a representative from Enelda, which is yeah. a huge doula organization, international um, doula organization, talking about the work that they do. And then you've got your doula directory in there as well. So I, I'm really impressed with all the resources. The fact that you're giving most of it away is pretty awesome. It is yeah. pretty awesome. You made an interesting point that I, I want to sort of focus on. You said you get to the point where you need to have conversations, but it, they're left so late, you don't have time to do the comprehensive planning. That mm-hmm. and, and I think that is probably the situation for so many more people in the United States, because we do neglect to have those conversations. And in my view, the single most important thing you can do in your advanced care plan, if you do nothing else, is designate a decision maker. What would you say is the most important document or action people need to take when it comes to advanced care planning? You say it is designating an individual that can make decisions on your behalf, and that is the core tenet of what advanced care planning is. Now, advanced directives mean different things in different states. Sure. Sometimes it's a legal document that's from the state itself. Sometimes it's, it's more general. I would say that there's a second step that is equally, if not more, important than that, and that is telling people where those documents are that need to know Because oftentimes what will end up happening is that someone will make a designation of, Helen, you're going to be my my healthcare proxy today, or you're going to have medical power of attorney, depending on where you are. And the document that explains what I want you to do is locked in a drawer or is in the bottom of a closet that I told you that you were my healthcare proxy. You said, yeah, this is great. I accept. Thanks for the honor. But when I get hit by that bus when I'm out on the road biking and I go to the hospital and they call you up, you go, yeah, he told me that I was that, but I don't know what he actually wants. <laughs> you know that that is my actual story. Is it? Yes. Yes. Longtime hey. family friend made me her medical power of attorney and we had zero conversations. Yeah. She became de- uh, debilitated and I became her decision maker. Completely clueless. I was flying by the seat of my pants. So so it, it's the equivalent of, of the need for the clear kit. We say when you start, the first thing you do is you tell three people that you're doing it and where it's going to be. And those are the individuals that need to be impacted because if they don't have access to the information quickly when they need it, it's as if it doesn't exist. Right. So if you tell somebody that they are or designate somebody legally that they're your proxy, but you don't give them the information to do it, it's as if you did nothing. So 
I'm going to link those two things as as extremely important. And depending on where you are in your life and, you know, if you have family or major life changes or whatnot, you also need to update. So a lot of people say, oh, I've got my advanced directives from 30 years ago. I'm good to go. No, <laughs> because your perspective on life is different today than it was then. Your medical treatments are different today than it was then. Um, and you need to account for that. So Absolutely. Relationships change. Maybe you don't want that person to make, be your, your executor or decision maker anymore. Maybe they're no and longer capable of making that decision. It, it's also a matter of, if not necessarily capability, it's ability to carry out your wishes. And that's something that a lot of people don't, don't realize is that when you are putting somebody in a legal position to act as your proxy, they are not supposed to be acting with what they think is in your best interest. They are supposed to be acting as if they were you and executing decisions based on how you would want them to do that. So a lot of people, they go, oh, well, I have to actually have so-and-so do it because they're the, the right person and right person in air quotes for people that are listening. Right. Re relationally. Yeah. Yes. But that person might not be somebody that shares the same values that you have. They might be someone that that is going to try and overrule what you've done. And that's not what you want. You have to have the right person informed with access to the information. And I mentioned Midio earlier. Like the reason why we like the company so much is they actually give you a wallet card that goes in your wallet that then something happens, they scan an ID or scan the QR, QR code, and then it goes to both video and paper copies of what your directives are because it's that interpretation factor that people interpret different things differently. So you speak to it as well of, of what you want. And we need to figure out how to just make things easier. So my wife actually has, so Gina is my 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 proxy in the event something were to happen to me. She has one of my cards in her wallet. So if she gets a phone call that says Adam got hit by a bus, she actually has all my information and knows what she has to do as well. So you're, I, she has your video card. She has a video card as well, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. It's really neat. Like they're they're doing some cool stuff. And there's a bunch of other companies out there that that we can speak to from legacy planning to estate information organization to historians. Like there's just so much in this space. Uh, one of the directories that we were launching is the other death tech directory. So it's other death tech estate planning and end of life companies because it is a space that is so unbelievably important. And with the stats going the way that they are. There's just going to be more innovations in it. So can I talk about some stats? Yes. Okay. In a nutshell. Every single day. <laughs> in a nutshell. I'm going to do it really quick. Every day in America, 10,000 Americans turn 65. That means that by the end of the decade, there's going to be twice as many people 65 and older than there are today. And some people say there'll be more people age 65 and older than under. Now, on average, women are outliving men when they're married in America by 5.8 years. And if you look at older generations with traditional family values, again, in air quotes, it means that one person in the family, typically the men, handle all the finances. Yes. And it's not because women are incapable. I know plenty of women that are far more you know, financially sound than, than their husbands and, and other people. But in a lot of those relationships, like my mom's, my dad handled all the bills and my mom didn't know how to pay the bills. Not like, how do I physically pay them, but what account do they come from? Is it on auto pay? What's important? What's not? And we need to start figuring out ways to get ahead of this because the longer we wait, the more challenging it's going to be. And there are a lot of tips and tricks that people just don't know that they should be aware of. Yeah, I think that it was sort of a stereotypical culture-driven roles and and I have to say that in my own household, in my own marriage, I don't manage the bill paying and all of that because, quite frankly, my husband loves managing the money and the stocks, and I hate it. Mm -hmm. I, I manage so many other things. We just sort of divided it out by skills and talents and and interest in the whole yeah, thing. It, it's It's not a right or wrong. It's a division of labor. And that oftentimes just goes to partnership. One person naturally gravitates to one thing or the other. But I'm going to put you on the spot right now. I imagine that you and your husband probably have credit cards, right? Sure. Did he, does he typically take out the credit cards in his name? Uh, so when you get a credit card, he applies for it, right? 
if he's paying the bills. No? No, they're in both our names. Absolutely. All right. So you have a credit card and he has a credit card, but who's the primary card holder? It's probably him. So he probably took the application out and then secondary card holder lists you. Maybe not. That's No, that's probably accurate. Okay. Okay. So if that is accurate, you're actually setting yourself up for a pretty bad situation if something were to happen to him. And here's why. If a primary card holder passes away and the credit card company knows about it or, or is informed, however they find out, whether it be from a credit card agency or something else, or you call them up, the secondary card holders will also lose access to their credit cards. So oh, wow. if you have a family member or a family situation where one individual has been the primary that takes out all the credit cards, you need to have that secondary person take out at least one credit card in their name as the primary. So if something happens to them, they still have access to credit. And that happened to my mom, for example. And this happens to countless other people where she went, oh no, what do I do? And fortunately, I was there, my sisters were there, we put stuff on credit cards, and then we opened up a new account for her. But that's something you shouldn't have to worry about. Right. And not everybody can do that. Yeah, exactly right. And it's these unknown unknowns. So I was talking to somebody in Virginia. He was married. He had two kids. He got a divorce. He updated his will. So if he gets hit by the bus, uh, why is it always getting hit by the why, bus? Yeah, why is the bus? Actually? That's so violent. How many buses? Um, he has a heart attack in the middle of the night, doesn't wake up. Uh, 50% of his assets go to each of his kids. But what he didn't realize is that he didn't update his payable on death beneficiaries on his accounts. So his bank accounts, his insurance policy, his benefits from his work, which meant that if something actually happened to him, his ex-wife gets all of, all of that because it's contractual and it gets processed before your will. Wow. There's a lot of things that happen in end of life that unless you've gone through it and someone has explained it to you, you're just not going to know. And that's really what we're trying to help people solve. We've got a checklist on our website that's, again, free. Uh, it's currently called the What to Do When Someone Dies checklist. It'll probably switch over to the end of life checklist that has 56 steps of this is what you need to do and this is why you need to do it. Uh, because if you don't know, you don't know, and we want to help you know. Yeah. I think, unfortunately, most people find out when they have to deal with the issues. Yeah. Adam, uh, this is this is such a useful conversation. I think I need to go and check some things in my own personal finances now. Um, so how can listeners connect with you, find the website, Buried in Work, all the resources that you guys have? Everything's online. It's buriedinwork.com. Uh, if you can get a clear kit, we'd appreciate it. That means that you're going to be a little bit organized. Your family members are going to be in a better situation and it helps us develop more content. The games are available as well. But if there's something that you're finding that you are just confused about that you need help with, come to the website. There's a contact form on the bottom of it. Fill it out. Uh, we have a lot of strange questions that come in. Sometimes we can answer them. Sometimes we can't. Uh, somebody actually just emailed us a day or two ago from Montana asking if we would buy all their power tools. We're not going to do that, but we're happy to introduce <laughs> you to an estate sale company that can. Uh, but yeah, buriedinwork.com or on Instagram now, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, all those places. And we'd appreciate your support because we want to support you. Awesome. Great conversation. Thank you so much, Adam. Helen, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Heart of Hospice podcast. Check out our sponsor in the show notes and please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. We would appreciate it if you would share this episode with your friends and family and anyone who needs to know more about hospice. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, no matter who you are or where you are in your hospice journey, you are the heart of hospice. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time.